On June 13th, Vocab Malone aired a live show titled Ice Cube Tweets Black Hebrew Israelite Memes on Twitter, end quote, uh, during which he had a segment on uh, dark imagery in general and the Black Madonna in particular, or Black Madonna depictions. And uh, that segment, that portion, went for slightly over 11 or so minutes. And uh, I thought it was quite good and felt, you know, it, it was one of the more fair and nuanced presentations on the subject of uh, dark icons and uh, Black Madonna uh, depictions in in particular. Uh, So in this video, I'd like to reproduce about 10 minutes from that segment, which is to say, you know, almost all of that segment on the Black Madonna. Uh, Now, I'll add some images and maybe a caption to help with illustrations, and uh, I'll have a bit to say near the beginning and uh, again at the end, but most of what will appear here will just be Vocab's presentation on the subject as it appeared in that uh, live show from back in June. So we'll pick up at about an hour and 13 minutes into the video. I think it's time to talk about Black Madonnas. I think it's time. Darker iconography, okay? It is a part of Catholic art history. That's a fact. And guess what? Roman Catholics know it. So do Protestants, at least the ones who are the iconoclast, especially. All right? It's not a surprise. It's not a, a big secret like the Hebrews like to, like to try to act sometimes. They act as if they're uncovering hidden secrets. No. There's whole books on the cult of the Black Virgin. Academic books and also books by feminist authors as well as those who are more mystical. I've been looking into this. There's numerous perspectives they approach it from. This is not a conspiracy theory to the Hebrews lights. You uncover this. Some people act as though when they find a dark icon, they are uncovering some long hidden secret. You know, the, some out there will insinuate that there has been a conspiracy to hide dark icons uh, and that the truth is now starting to trickle out. The reality, however, is that these things were never hidden. You know, these dark images were never hidden, and those who sincerely argue otherwise honestly are telling us more about how limited their own personal experiences were than they are about the reality which existed beyond their experiences. Uh, Now, as a disclaimer, I'm not trying to disparage or disrespect anyone, uh, so I'll put it this way. If you grew up in, like, let's say, some rural part of the country, I can understand if your experiences with Christian art were limited. However, if you grew up in a place like New York City or, you know, the Northeast in general, then there were honestly dark images all around you. And, you know, if you didn't see them, if you never encountered them, that might speak more to what I was saying. It might speak more to the the limitations on your own experience, not what actually existed in your environment. Uh, But I'll, I'll share a few examples. Uh, in the in the 80s, I personally saw processions of a uh, statue of, uh, you know, a replica of Our Lady of Montserrat uh, outside St. Bridget's Church on Avenue B in Lower Manhattan. So, you know, try to, for those who are familiar with Lower Manhattan and the Lower East Side, try to imagine people carrying a statue of the Black Madonna of Montserrat around Tonkin Square Park. Uh, aside from that, on East 13th Street in Manhattan, there was a storefront shrine to the Sicilian Black Madonna of uh, Tindari. Uh, it was there for decades, for most of the 20th century, and uh, that block even held a feast every September, right up until the end of the 70s, right up until the end of the 1970s. Uh, aside from that, uh, inside St. Patrick's Cathedral, Uh, which, by the way, is the seat of the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of New York, there's a shrine to the Black Madonna of Chistechowa, again, whose feast day is today. And that isn't something from the past. That shrine is there at St. Patrick's Cathedral right now, today. Uh, Then, aside from that, there's uh, St. Stanislaus Church, which is on uh, East 7th Street in Manhattan. Uh, When you go inside that church, you'll see that the centerpiece above the altar, right at the front of the church, is an icon of the very same Black Madonna of Chinstechowa. And uh, I want to reiterate and emphasize that the icon of the Black Madonna is not tucked in some side chapel. Rather, it's at one of the most prominent spots right at the front of the church. You know, it's the, the entire congregation is facing in that direction. And then, you know, if we go beyond New York, there's the National Shrine of Our Lady of Czestochowa, so a national shrine dedicated to the Polish Black Madonna in uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. It's this large shrine dedicated to the Black Madonna has been there for decades, 
And uh, it's not an insignificant place. You know, on the contrary, when the shrine was first dedicated in 1966, the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, attended the dedication ceremony. And then if you go on a little 45-minute drive from the shrine of the Black Madonna in, uh, in Doylestown, you can reach uh, Philadelphia's Cathedral Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul. The depiction of La Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, which you see here. And uh, by the way, on an interesting side note, the Mexican de depiction of La Virgen de Guadalupe is actually named after a black Madonna depiction in uh, Extremadura, Spain, uh, which was the subject of... Uh, you know, some of the sorts of medieval legends of miraculous protection that Vocab will mention later on in this video. I want to briefly touch on the issue of popes and the Black Madonna, because, you know, there's certain folks on the internet who they'll, they'll show an image of a pope before a Black Madonna depiction and declare something along the lines of, look what the pope does in secret, you know, but the reality is, is that such photos were not taken surreptitiously, you know, that they weren't taken by secret cameramen or something like that. Rather, the Pope is almost always at a well-known public shrine, you know. Let's take, for example, the current Pope, uh, Pope Francis, showing honor to the Black Madonna of um, Aparecida in Brazil. So this was far from some sort of secret or private act. Rather, he did so at one of the largest churches in the world, the Basilica of the National Shrine of Our Lady of Aparecida in Brazil. And uh, I'll play a clip, and as you watch it, note how large the church is and how many people are in attendance. You know, a, a secret known by thousands of people and transmitted around the globe is not actually a secret. It's just news. We don't know unless they specifically say the intention of any particular image maker. We just don't know. Now, there's Catholic legends that a lot of these black Madonnas were actually made by Luke. Yeah, Dr. Luke, the one who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, author of the third gospel, as it's called. That he made a bunch of them, and then in some instances, Peter later transported them. I don't buy into these Catholic legends. There's no historical reason to. But they try to say, the, the Catholics, that Luke actually made some of them. But in reality, we don't know most of these people, especially when it comes to icons. Icons, especially in the Eastern tradition, are not supposed to be signed because they're not considered paintings. The icons in the Eastern tradition, now I know we're talking about icon statues, there's different things here, right? Uh, in the Eastern tradition are actually considered to be written and they're supposed to be exegeted. You can actually find instances where there will be Catholics or Orthodox guys who will bring up a painting beside them, an icon, and actually preach from it as if it's a text. I've seen this. It's online. That's the way they view this. So we have to realize there's a deeper thing about how to read these going on for the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox traditions, okay? I don't agree with it, but that's a fact, okay? We don't know a lot of times, most of the time, hardly ever, who made these when they were made for sure, so it ends up with speculation. So with that, what can we say? Number one, some were deliberately painted dark. That is true. Now there's a variety of reasons. Let's give possible reasons. One possibility, of course, is the most obvious, that the artist guessed that the given subject looked that way. Meaning the artist thought the person they were portraying was dark like that. So the artist would assume the subject, Black Madonna or Christ in this case, were dark skinned. There is a long and widespread history of Black Madonnas and Black Christ depictions. Uh, Boo has a family member, like I said earlier, who's actually done research on the medieval Spanish opinions on the subject. It's kind of fascinating. There are some clergy during that day who thought the darker depictions were more authentic and some of them even transmitted these legends about some of these images being miraculously, miraculously protected from touch-ups. I kid you not. And during that medieval period, there are some people in Spain who had thought that the certain darker depictions of Mary were more authentic, basically. Some thought that these darker depictions would be miraculously protected by God or could protect you. There's uh, an example, I guess, that you can find if you look through the literature that I'm aware of. That a soldier would run into the run into battle uh, versus Muslims holding a black Madonna image instead of a sword, and then attribute victory to the image being on the battlefield, and then that would be cited as evidence for the authenticity of the image. 
This is the medieval era we're talking about. What's another reason they might be darker? Sometimes they were originally made black in this way. Because in the Middle Ages, there were theologians who supported uh, a allegorical or mystical understanding of song, uh, song as in Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. I'm, I'm not trying to say psalm. It's hard to get out of my mouth. Songs 1-5, they would say that it mystically refers actually to Mary. And so, for example, talking about Sicily again, there's a Sicilian black Madonna in Tindari. It literally quotes Songs 1-5 on its base. You can see it. Nigga sum et famosa. Nigga sum et famosa. There's a medieval Iberian practice that's Spanish and Portuguese of interpreting songs one five, applying to the Black Madonna, and uh, so you can find it in Italy and Spain. And uh, <clears throat> I just mentioned one at the shrine there, the Black Madonna in Sicily. And look, if you want to find this stuff, you can run a Google image search on the phrase Madonna Nera N E R A space D I space T I N D A R I Tindari. The English equivalent is the Black Madonna of Tindari or a variation. And you'll get lots of pictures of that famous statue. And you'll see on the base of the statue in Latin, Migrasum said Formosa. Uh wait yeah, um yeah yeah. Oh I, I um I mispronounced one of the words earlier. But uh you get the same idea. That's uh basically the ancient Latin Vulgate translation of I am black but beautiful. And so, some of the clergy, as I mentioned, especially the Spanish and Portuguese one, thought that these were more authentic, and they would apply Song Song uh, Song of Solomon one five to it. It's a very uh, highly allegorical interpretation uh, of the text, obviously, and basically makes this 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 wife of Solomon a cryptic prophecy about the Black Madonna, which would be uh, inaccessible to the average reader. But they saw this black and beautiful reference as uh, literal, basically, and so. Um, it actually says black but beautiful if you read the text, but some of them made it uh, uh, different in the way they actually worded it, which is black and beautiful. Now, I discussed the most obvious way. Um, these are just the facts that we know from speculation, what we can try to gather. And the next one is true. My guess is, the second I mention this, this will become the whole topic that all Hebrews like to talk about. But the fact is, it's true. Okay, it's just a fact. The, the other reason, potentially, why some of these are darker, I said some, this is more relates to the icons, is through the, is through the process of oxidation, accumulation of soot, those two things. It is true that some of the older icons really did darken over long periods of time of sharing a space with candles and incense, because guess what? Smells and bells. The Catholics, and especially the Orthodox, I got all this other stuff going on, and it affects the surface. Now, um, the candles and incense can have different effects on different colors. And actually, there's a video online that you can watch. I might try to post it later. And uh, when these accretions get removed, it has a more dramatic darkening effect sometimes, uh, they can tell once it's removed, on like a peakish beige color, uh, which is employed for the depiction of skin. And, but but then it doesn't affect other things the same way. Now, some people are going to say, oh, that doesn't sound right. But it's just the facts. I have a friend who talks about when he moved into this little apartment that uh, he burned a lot of candles and incense over a five-year period. And it dramatically altered the light beige walls in the house, but had no effect on darker items in the house, like his cupboards. So it only affected something. You know what I'm saying? And also, we have to understand, when we see one thing that's affected one way and one thing that's affected another way, we have to ask ourselves all kinds of questions. Have these, have these items been moved over the decades? Was one higher or lower than the other? Because a lot of times the higher portions, for example, uh, would get more darkened. Uh, if they were under the same conditions, then uh, the differences in the painting themselves could account for some things. If one depiction is darker than the other, even before... Uh, accretions begin and it's very possible you have a dark skin a light skin and uh, these both have long histories in the history of christian art and these are just realities now i give you some information on the black madonna um you have to buy some books 
I'll try to remember to drop a link here for a book that's free. It's a 16th century Spanish work by Padre Pedro de Borgo. He's a Catholic abbot from Spain, and he talks about uh, Black Madonna there in, in Catalonia. And uh, you can look there, and he and there's some key images there, specifically uh, pages 34 to 35. If you look, you'll see what I'm talking about. The book folk had mentioned at the end, or at least alluded to at the end, and uh, this is the book right here. Libro de la Historia y Milagros Hechos a Invocación de Nuestra Señora de Montserrat by uh, Padre Pedro de Burgos, who was uh, some sort of uh, abbot of a monastery back in the 1500s. Now, I'll share a link to this book in the video description. Uh, before I get to the pages which uh, Vocab referenced, I first want to show something from uh, a few pages earlier, uh, which is the back of page 32. Now, note that in this particular work, each numbered page is treated as two-sided, front and back, or uh, recto inverso, as they say. So, on the back of page 32 begins the description of the statue of Our Lady of Montserrat. Uh, as seen at the bottom of your screen, the author writes the following uh, regarding this uh, depiction of the Black Madonna. Uh, quote, Su cara es moreno y muy bien formada, y muy deletable a la vista, uh, which means uh, her face is dark and very well formed and quite delightful to view. Now, here are the pages which vocab reference, which is pages uh, 34 and 35. Starting on the back of page 34, the author says the following regarding the image. Uh, Ha sido conservada por Dios sin más ser en lugar ni tocar ninguno en ella. Uh, it has been preserved by God without anything in her being, uh, I guess, uh, renewed or touched up. Then the author adds the following. Sobre el color de ella contaremos aquí el primer milagro, aunque no sea primero en tiempo. Uh, meaning, uh, regarding her color, we will state here that it's the first miracle, even if it's not the first in terms of time. Uh, I, I take that to mean that it's the primary miracle, though not necessarily the first one chronologically. Uh, then, uh, if we turn to the next page, which is to say the front of page 35, the following legend is recounted. Hizo uh, llamar a un pintor de Severa llamado Maestre Andrés para que la adobase y reparase. A painter from uh, Cervera, which is a place in Spain, was called in and he was known as uh, Master Andrés or Teacher, Andrés the Teacher. And, uh, uh, this uh, master Andres or Maestre Andres was called in to fix up and remove the image, to, to, to touch up the statue. Uh, the author continues with the following. Uh, uh, Como empezase por las espaldas de la imagen, luego en ese punto cegó. When he began to do that work, uh, he was blinded on the spot. And uh, then on the following page, which is to say the back of page 35, the author bluntly states the following regarding the reason for this miraculous blinding that befell uh, uh, Master Andres or Maestre Andres. Uh, Quote, uh, Dios no permitía por alguno fuese renovada. Uh, God does not allow for anything on her to be altered. And thus we see what vocab had alluded to, these sorts of medieval legends about dark images being miraculously protected and that in turn, you know, being sort of tacit evidence of their authenticity uh, or God's approval of those images. <laughs> <laughs>